Hi, this week I'd like to share a little bit of some of the work that we're doing and we're going to talk a little bit about remote sensing and how it is that we capture data. So an example here on the left hand side is what a satellite is doing and on the right hand side is the image that it would capture as it scans around the world. Now often what we do with remote sensing is to also do some field surveys. So here looking at conducting a transect to try and understand what's, what's under the water in this particular case looking at measuring trees, doing some spectrometer work with corals, and looking at canopy cover. So what we try and do is to use the field work to understand exactly what's on the ground, but then use the satellite data to essentially scale that information up and make maps over large areas. But what we see is that there's quite a different scale between our observations. So for example, while we're in the field, we're looking at various different features. So for example, trees, grasses, etc. We're looking up at them potentially, and we've got a really, really fine resolution. But when we're a satellite, we look over much, much larger areas, but our footprint is also larger. So an example here is the Landsat satellite, where its individual observation is 30 meters, so a 30 by 30 meter pixel. And it's also looking down on things, which is different to what we do when we're looking up in the field. So in between those two scales, we've got airborne data, and this has a much finer resolution. So we might say get two to eight meters or so, and even, even sub-meter in some cases, depending on the particular sensor and aircraft and how high it flies. Doesn't cover quite as much area as a satellite, has that same perspective, but it's still a lot coarser than what we see in the field. And so now what we're doing is to bring, bring in remotely controlled aircraft or unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. So this gives us a similar scale to what we see when we're observing things in the field, but the same perspective as the airborne or satellite data doesn't quite cover as much of an area. So it just sort of fills that gap in between there. Now, if you have a look at some of the benefits, this is an example of Orpheus Island and Pioneer Bay. So there's the James Cook University Research Station buildings just down here, and we've got a coral reef environment. And now this is a satellite image. This is pretty close to what you'd see on Google Earth, for example. So you can start to see individual trees. There's the problem with cloud. That's always going to be an issue with satellite data. But that's the best commercially available color imagery that we see. If we want to get slightly better resolution, so we'll, we'll zoom all the way in here. This is a bunch of mangroves, and so you can't really outline where each individual tree is, but you can, you can get a feel for where the mangroves are. If you want to go a little bit finer detail, you can use black and white imagery. So this is called panchromatic, and this allows us to get slightly finer detail, and this is also from satellite data. In this case, both of these images are Pleiades imagery. But if we want to have a look at a drone, you'll see that we get a lot, lot finer detail. And we can also modify this by the height that we fly at. So legally, we're allowed to fly up to 122 meters in altitude or 400 feet. And you can see from this image here, this is probably at about 60 meter height, I would say. And this shot taken just with a standard GoPro camera, you'll see you can start to see individual branches. And if certainly if you fly a little lower, you'll get leaves as well if you're interested in that scale. So you may have seen drones quite a bit in the media um, used for all sorts of things or claims that they're getting used for all sorts of things such as transportation, looking at provision of health services, search and rescue, recovery and even delivery of different items. And this is sort of the, the media going a little bit crazy saying yeah these are all the fabulous things that drones are great for. Um, but the reality is they're, they're good for selfies and that's that's where the operational state is at the moment. So while drones will most likely be used for all of these sorts of applications in the future, we're not quite there yet with the technology. But for selfies, fabulous. And also what we're trying to do then is just to take it a little bit further to look at the beautiful imagery that we can get from, from drones and see if we can get some quantitative mapping products out of this. So this is an image of Heron Island that I took earlier this year, and you can actually see individual coral colonies in here. And so this is looking back towards the island. And so what we want to see is if we can get some quantitative mapping products, like where are the corals, where's the algae, and what other sorts of features that we can see. You can also see some marine wildlife in the, in the channel along here as well. 
So just to explain a little bit about Heron Island, which is where I, I took that photo that you just saw before, and also where we're headed on our field work this week, and give a bit more context to the sort of work that we do. So again, this is a satellite image, and just to give a bit of context, the whole reef across this way is about 11 kilometers, and it's about four kilometers in the north-south direction here. Now this part here is the island, so it's actually a very small island, 800 metres long and 400 metres north-south here. So most of the work that we do is sort of contained in around this part of the reef. That's readily accessible from the island and then you need boats to get further out. But if you have a look at this section here, what I've just done is I've taken a cross section through this component because it shows the main reef environments that we're going to have a look at and just flipping it on its side for convenience sake. Okay, so we're going to have a look through here. So north is now pointing to the right on the figure. So if we have a look at this conceptually, again, you've got that figure just up the top there from the satellite image. So you can start to get a feel for what different features actually look like. So off the left and the right hand side, so the south and the north of the image, you'll see we've got deeper waters. You can see this just off the reef crest here. Now in the deeper waters is, is where we get the nice live coral and that's where we want to go diving usually. As we come up, we hit the reef crest, and this is where we get a lot of rock and rubble. So often this is exposed at low tide, so it's a pretty harsh environment. And it gets a lot of wave action all the time there as well. Just back in from the, the rock on the crest, um, you'll find some rubble areas. So this is usually the, the small corals that have been knocked about, um, and they'll sort of deposit themselves just in from the crest environment. Now you can also see this, this example here, so this is a, a mat of benthic microalgae, that's a cyanobacteria that sort of lives in the, in the sand there, perfectly healthy and um, normal part of the ecosystem. And then this part is the lagoon, so we see there's deeper water here and some coral bommies, which is a range of coral and algae sitting in amongst there. And so you get coral in amongst the reef crests, in these bombies, and in all the way along the reef in patches as well. And then there's some large components of sand. This is what they look like close up. So we've got some beautiful live coral, some rocky areas, rubble, some sand, and some algae areas there as well. So it's all part of trying to understand what we've got on the reef and what we'd like to be mapped. So if we have a look at some of the previous work that we've done, again, this is a beautiful high resolution satellite image. And I'm just going to zoom into this particular area here. Now again, you can see the island and you start to see the buildings in this particular image. So on the, the western side of the island, this the southern component is where the University of Queensland Research Station is. And on the northern side is a resort and the remainder is on National Park. Now the yellow squiggly lines that you see there are from a drone survey that we did earlier this year. And we're going to repeat some of that and try and get some better results. But what I'm going to do is zoom into another small area just here to give you a feel for the difference between the satellite and the drone imagery. So here's our satellite imagery. You can see that it's quite pixelated um, and you can see those yellow lines over the top, which is all pre-programmed -pre drone survey. And now if you have a look, this is actually what the drone is pulling out over that area. So that's hundreds of photos stitched together. We can zoom all the way in and you can see that this, this was an incredible day to take this imagery. There is water over the top of that, but it's a very small amount. It was at a low tide. And the detail that you can see from this image taken at about 20 meters up just with a GoPro camera. So a really small drone. From that, we can also use the overlapping images to create 3D models. And this is really useful if we want to start looking about looking at the rugosity of the reef and the, the, the textures and stuff that we see and the types of critters that might like to live in, live in some of those little caverns. It's also really interesting to see where water can pool and flow through the reef as well. Having a look in a little bit more detail, we like to create maps out of this. So zoomed quite highly into this particular image and then using an automatic classification tool to draw out exactly where the algae, coral, rock, rubble and sand are. And we do this in an automated way because it takes too long to do this sort of thing manually. It's also interesting to see this is around the channel area that if you zoom into this particular area, we can pull out some of the sharks. And again, this is an automated technique to do this. So what I also do is to work on thermal imagery. 
and I'm particularly interested in doing that on this trip that we've got coming up at the moment. So what we're going to do is to use a thermal camera to look at the temperature of the reef. So the reason why we want to do that, for example, is if we have coral, we know that it is quite sensitive to variations in water temperature. And if, it, if the water temperature gets past a certain threshold, we also know that the corals tend to expel their symbiotic algae, which is called zooxanthellae, and that they essentially spit the algae out and that means that they can no longer photosynthesize or provide their own food source and eventually what happens is we get a transition from the beautiful healthy reef down to an algae covered reef. So what we're interested in doing is having a look at the reef environment. So this is a photo just from the ground at this stage on Heron Reef. And you can see this is just in the channel on the right hand side. We've got a boat just here for context. And there's a, a, a bund wall that's been constructed to keep the, um, to keep the channel um, nice and uh, without being filled in with sand. And so if you have a look at that, we can look at that image, but in terms of temperature. So what you've got here are the warmer temperatures just over the bund wall and you can see we've got warmer temperatures on the boat here and this is taken at night time. And it's interesting to see that there is quite a degree of variation in the water temperatures across the reef. And so we're interested to see if we can use a drone to map this effect. So what we've been doing is to, to fit out one of our drones. This is, this is an Aeronavix bot um, and her name's Bronte. So we've been fitting her out with, with some special lights to, to be able to fly at night time and doing some testing and making sure that we're integrating our thermal sensor with that craft. Uh, once we've got that, it's a little bit finicky out in the field at night time. This is just for some, from some test flights. So we need to sort of make sure everything's all set up and then we can pop it up in the air. And so you can see Bronte up there, it sort of looks like the moon actually, but that is, that is the bright white light, a little oversaturated from the iPhone there. So th these are just from, for some, from some test flights that we've been doing. And we also did some flights earlier this year on Orpheus to, to see if this was going to work. We did it with a slightly cheaper camera and system. And what, what we're able to see is from the areas that we did map, so on this the southwestern portion of the, of the bay just here, we can see that we're starting to see a variation in water temperature. So just, just to give you a bit of an idea, we can also see the individual boats, for example, and we can see here are the variations if we zoom into individual frames here. And again, we've got that, that difference in temperature as we see water flows in. So what we're going to try and do in this upcoming trip is to obtain imagery at four o'clock every morning. So just before dawn is the best time to get thermal data. And what we're trying to see is, is how, the, how the temperature varies across the reef and can we track this at different times of the tidal cycle as well. So we know that satellites are able to obtain thermal information over, over the reef, but at a much, much coarser scale. And they, this sort of information is used to look at predicting coral bleaching hotspots. But what we're interested in finding out is just how representative of those coarse scale satellite predictions are when you consider really fine scale temp temperature variations and what's actually driving them. So obviously there's some action with the current, there'll be some winds and then the structure of the reef itself. So we've got quite a few things to investigate, both we're doing some straight benthic mapping and then really focusing in on getting our thermal data collected and then analysed with this trip.